We are so thankful you've chosen to spend some of your time with us to continue learning from the collective knowledge of our NYU community. Today's guest lecture is Damon McCoy, Associate Professor of Computer Science and Engineering at NYU Tandon School of Engineering. Professor McCoy, at this time, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you. Thank you all that have decided to share your lunch break with me. So I'm going to be talking about cybercrime and kind of the business aspect of cybercrime. So just kind of to ground this talk right, when I'm speaking about cybercrime, probably everyone at this point has had some brush with a cyber criminal trying to attack them in some way. One of the more common things, right, is the phishing email that tries to steal your logger and credentials. There can be you know, the spammy email or online social networking posts that has the URL link in it, click on the URL and they try and sell you counterfeit pharmaceuticals, counterfeit luxury goods, and things like that. So these are these are some of the ways that these cyber criminals try and actually profit from their activities. And then right, the one that's been in the news a lot is the ransomware within here where it encrypts the files and then tries to extort you for some sum of money through something like Bitcoin within there. And then there's kind of the right, the more headline grabbing you know, Michael Crichton kind of espionage stories right, of the shadowy international hackers that hack into some kind of military infrastructure within here. Um, and a lot of these are sometimes the same people that try and sell you Viagra and things like that. And they're kind of moonlighting as contractors for different governments within here doing various kinds of cyber criminal activity within here. So um, the other thing to note is that I would love for this to be interactive. So I only have about 30 minutes um, of material. So feel free to ask questions within here. And I see that Bob has asked a question here of what companies are on the leading edge of cybersecurity? Um, that's a good question. It's, it's one of the unfortunate things of cybersecurity that it's kind of, it's hard to tell who's on the leading edge because oftentimes you know, in cybersecurity, right? We do things, we deploy defenses, but it's really hard to know how effective what we're doing in the defenses that we deploy really are within there. So there's certainly you know, a lot of companies that are investing heavily and cybersecurity, you know, some of the major tech firms, like Amazon, Google, Facebook, and the, that certainly have very large cybersecurity budgets. You know, they they put a lot of money and invest a lot of money into cybersecurity. Microsoft is another one that comes to mind within there. And these companies, you know, are probably close to the leading edge of cybersecurity within there, if you assume that. You know, investment tracks with kind of security maturity within there, but that's that's a really hard question. If if we could answer that question, probably we'd have a lot less cybersecurity problems <laughs> within there. If we were better at evaluating the effectiveness of cybersecurity. So, if anyone else has any questions, feel free to you know unmute your mic, just call them out in voice within there, or I'll try and monitor the chat as well. In there, uh, but I encourage you. Go ahead. Hi, Damon. Uh, this is Robert. Um, I want to thank you for taking the time out. I was typing a message, and now that I can speak, and it's a little easier. So you have threat actors that are conducting crime, cyber crime. Yep. And, um, clearly, one way to uh, to mitigate the behavior is to drive cost to them, or some punishment, or some sort of uh, something that that creates a consequence that's uh, a negative enough that that they look to do something else, get out of the business of cybercrime. What what kinds of things? Uh, what are the impediments to to doing uh, just that? So you you you've kind of hit the nail on the head in terms of what this talk is about, and what I'm going to kind of run you through in this talk. I won't I won't perhaps focus as much on that question, but that question certainly is relevant, and you know it hits the nail on the head that right that. You know, cyber criminals are doing this for profit within here, right? And the probably the most effective way of you know reducing cyber crime 
it is to simply you know make it unprofitable mm -hmm. for them where it's not worth their while with there so i'm i'm going to talk about kind of you know some strategies within there but it's you know right there's a lot of asymmetries that you know favor the attackers in this space in terms of you know legal jurisdictions and you know emergence of deregulated payment platforms like cryptocurrency and stuff like that that certainly make it hard to actually achieve that economic disruption but i will this talk will kind of go into the economics and at least one example of an economic disruption that we did that was you know at least at the time that we did it effective very good could I give a follow-up question? Of course. I am uh, being attacked by people who claim my McAfee expired 10 to 20 times a day. All of these have different email addresses. And I have the sense that these are coming from two or three sources, just because the text is identical, but the mm -hmm. source is different. And how do you, how does, uh, society handle the extreme plasticity of uh, the nominal sources of these things yeah it's it's um again it's it's hard i mean i will uh, this the, yeah this is one of the revenue sources basically kind of tech support you know, fake antivirus kinds of scams yeah well, within I'm, here yeah, yeah i'm using this as an example i have mm -hmm. lots of other examples right me, yeah i'm sure everyone in this call is getting these things dozens of times a day and right, I, by yeah. the way i don't have mcafee on the computer so it's easy <laughs> to pick these out right yeah yeah uh, untargeted kind of scams within your um i mean again there's there's you know there's a lot of ways that one can do it yeah. within there right you can certainly you know try and improve your email filters but it at some point it's kind of diminishing returns yeah. as to how much you can filter no, but, but it's, of this it, stuff, you know, yeah. It seems it's not so much the source, but uh, interrupting the payment, which I'm sure you'll get into. The interrupting the payment is, yes, the, one of the big focuses Thank you. Let of me, this talk. Let me, let, let me be quiet and listen to you. Thanks. No problem. <laughs> these, these are all good questions. Um, I had one more question from Bob here in the text about uh, quantum computing and cybersecurity, security in general. So. Quantum computer, one of the big things that it will disrupt in security is cryptography. So you know, cryptography is kind of this mathematical techniques that people use to you know, authenticate each other, you know, obfuscate messages so that you can send a message encrypted and people that gain a copy of the encrypted message won't be able to decrypt it within there. And so quantum computers, when they scale large enough and they become reliable enough, could break a lot of the cryptographic algorithms that we currently have within here. And then so attackers that can get copies, you know, oftentimes we call these eavesdrop attackers. They can eavesdrop on messages, get copies of the encrypted messages. If they have a quantum computer like this, you know, the conventional cryptography that we currently use is vulnerable to these quantum computers, a lot of it within there, especially um, a form of cryptography that we call asymmetrical cryptography. So RSA algorithm in particular becomes vulnerable to a quantum computer. With quantum computers, you can easily decrypt messages encrypted with RSA within there. So it will it will certainly weaken the cryptography of a lot of currently deployed systems. And so there's a lot of people working on what is called post-quantum cryptography within there. I am not a cryptographer, so I, I will not even try and talk to you about it, but basically uh, new cryptographic algorithms that you know, factor in quantum, known quantum computing algorithms and would still be at least to the best of our knowledge, resistant to quantum computer attacks. So within there, go ahead. So, so Damon, while, while we're on that topic of, of, of technology and having an impact, um, let's go ahead and add uh, artificial intelligence in there as, as well. 
and, and, and its impact and the implications of artificial, of, of AI, my machine learning uh, mm -hmm. in, in this space. Um, you know, somewhere in the presentation, I don't have to answer it now, but uh, uh, grab a hold of that one too. Yeah, yeah sure. Make, yeah. Make videos and those kinds of things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this talk won't touch a lot on that, but that. Uh, I guess I'll I'll talk I'll talk about AI in one part. So I'll, I'll try and talk about it in there yes. in the context of um, what are called CAPTCHAs. Gotcha. So basically, challenges trying to detect a human or not. Yep. That's within there. So I, I'll I'll touch on AI there, um, but kind of saying that the attackers honestly don't invest much in AI currently within there, and I'll kind of talk about why that is. Okay. That's good. Enough. Okay, because um, yeah, that's definitely, again, another key factor in cybersecurity and for cyber criminals within there. So myself, a whole bunch of other researchers that have you know, collaborated with me on this research, picture an army of like 30 other researchers from you know, major companies like Google, major academic institutions like UC Berkeley and things like that have kind of We've been looking at the underground economy for, you know, over a decade at this point. And kind of the, the big overarching theme that we found is that the underground economy is, you know, basically this loose federation of specialists that are selling different kinds of capabilities, services, and resources that are explicitly tailored to cyber attacks. and then you know, some cyber criminals purchase these or sell these and kind of cobble them into the attacks that actually make money within here. And so I'll just touch on a few of what we call the profit centers of cyber crime, right? So one of them is a spam advertised goods, like the counterfeit pharmaceuticals, counterfeit luxury goods within there. Another one that was mentioned is the tech support scams. So the AV scams and other kinds of tech support scams, and there's other types of scams within here. And these start, you know, getting more kind of theft and less kind of selling a product within here. And then there's this technique that's called click fraud, basically stealing money from advertisers by um, pretending to be a real human eyeball and stealing advertising revenue from ad companies within there. And then, right, we have the extortion from the ransomware. And then we have just outright theft, like banking theft and financial theft and things like that. And so these are all probably all profit centers that people are aware of and have encountered within your, and this is basically the external flow of capital into the underground within your. So this is the, the source of capital that keeps the rest of the underground and abusive activity going. Within your, and David mentioned the NIST competition for the quantum safe cryptography within your. So yeah, so there's NIST is, NIST for those of you that aren't familiar with is a standards body in the US within here that standardizes technology. And um, they've been responsible for most of the standardized cryptography that we've had in the past. And they're running a, a currently ongoing challenge looking for you know, post-quantum, quantum computer safe cryptography within here. And so they, they finished one of their rounds within here, but there's still many rounds probably of this competition to go before we actually are able to identify you know, quantum safe cryptography albums for the next generation standards of cryptography. Okay, so with that digression out of the way, these are the these are things that probably most people are aware of and have read about or experienced within here. They're kind of the the victim facing, public facing of cybercrime within here. But beneath the service is a whole bunch of what we call support services within here. So support centers that actually enable those high level attacks within here. So these are things like um, actual malware within here. So there's actual, right? There's programmers that actually write and build the malware 
with an ear. So things like banking Trojans, you know, Zeus, Spy Eye were some of the original ones. I think there's there's new ones on the market these days. There's you know um, ransomware gangs like Conti that write and develop the ransomware within there. And then there's you know the quick fraud bots like zero access and things like that that do the quick fraud that I was talking about stealing from the online advertisers. And then there's like the, the spam botnets. Originally they were email spam botnets. Now there's a lot of social media spam bots as well within there. So they build the malware payload within there. And then, right, you have to distribute the malware. So there's a whole nother group of support services that focus on malware distribution within here. And the malware distribution is done in several different ways. And there's, there's groups that will help distribute the malware within there. And then there's another layer that's called the, oftentimes the traffic acquisition layer here within here. So this layer is focused on say, you know, bulk registering or bulk compromising people's accounts to distribute different kinds of spam or you know, do mal malware distribution or things like that. This is this is a building block that can be used for a lot of different types of cybercrime activity. And so these are things like email, social networks, and things like that within there. Um, as some of our research, we looked at the email account registration ecosystem. When we began looking at it, uh, I believe I could purchase a million Yahoo accounts for um, a few hundred dollars within there, but the email webmail providers have you know, gotten better in their defenses these days. And this is one area where we can actually measure their defenses because we can see the, the cost of their accounts rising <laughs> within there. So we can tell likely that you know, these defenses are effective because the cost of purchasing these you know, bulk accounts has risen over time. So when Google say added you know, um, text message verification, phone number verification to their account registration process. This had a order of magnitude effect in increasing the price of their accounts within here. So we could tell, yes, this was effective at making it more expensive for people to register email accounts within there. And similar defenses that, you know, um, services like Facebook have put into place have also risen increase the the price point of the account so this is an interesting area where you can monitor these and in fact a lot of companies do monitor the price of their accounts on these underground forums and this tips them off perhaps when you know one of their defenses is no longer as effective so that's part of an investigation with um, gmail looking at their accounts within there so their accounts had been selling at roughly two to three hundred dollars per thousand they noticed a price dip, dip. A price drop where the the price of their accounts dropped to you know, sub hundred dollar levels per thousand within there and this tipped them off that there was a problem with their this sms text-based uh, you know, authentication of their accounts so they launched an investigation we looked at it and we we found basically like um, voip providers that they were abusing when there that were giving away free VoIP numbers. Ironically, Google Voice was one of the VoIP providers that they were abusing <laughs> within there. So we we built some defenses to improve their you know phone reputation system and things like that, and their SMS verification system. And once those were deployed, the prices rose again. So this was a way to actually measure the effectiveness of the defense. This is this is kind of a rare signal that you can use to actually figure out are your defenses working or not. A question about that, please. Sure. Uh, yeah, uh, when you do your research into the uh, price to uh, acquire the, uh, the purloined materials, uh, do you do the research yourself on the dark web, or do you obtain it from the vendors? And and if you do it on the dark web and do your research uh, on the dark web, how do you prevent your own research staff from becoming victims uh, as they work around in the dark web? Good question. Um, the, the monitoring of the pricing was done by Google within there. So they had implemented their own pricing 
I did, I was the one that was responsible for the purchasing. I normally, you know, I take a lot of precautions in this, you know, VPNs, you know, ways of protecting my identity from the attackers with no, this is, this is not something that I have uh, ordinary students or things like that do. I've had a lot of, you know, experience do, do in you, ways of kind of safely doing this. Go yeah. ahead. Yes. Uh, do you take measures to uh, qualify uh, yourself in the eyes of the uh, proprietors of the dark web websites so that they uh, trust you to sell you the materials? Because I understand that uh, that you have to qualify; otherwise, uh, they won't uh, disclose what they have for sale. In many cases, that's a good question. Um, email accounts are considered a fairly low risk activity within there, so there's not much vetting that occurs of buyers of you know, bulk registered email accounts. It's really, it's not, you know, I, I don't know of anyone that's gotten arrested for buying or selling um, bulk registered email accounts within there. So much cyber criminals consider this to be a fairly risk area where they don't do much vetting. There are areas where there is more vetting and those areas I don't do. So those, those areas normally I rely on third party security companies. So we, we have a good relationship with some of the local New York cybersecurity companies like Flashpoint and things like that, that have people that have even more training and you know, language skills in Russian and China, Chinese and things like that, that are able to you know, bypass the vetting and do the, you know, get access to what are considered the more secretive high risk kind of services within there. So I, I, yeah, that, that's beyond my skill capability within there, but uh, good questions. Um, there's, there's also things, you know, like search engine optimization and things like that, that get, you know, clicks within there. And then there's just the raw building blocks of you know, acquiring servers and networks and proxies and domain names and you know captcha solving services services to bypass sms challenges money mules to you know, accept stolen bank accounts payments and you know um, basically cash them out through services like western union or probably now bitcoin within there and things like that so these are all support center services that can be provided within here. And a lot of these support services are bought and sold under what are called cybercrime forums within here. So this is an example of a cybercrime forum. This was Google translated from Russian. Within here where they're selling a whole bunch of different support services for abusive behavior. Within here, so you can see, you know, scripts for telegram, scams, you know, spam, flooding type software, um, cloaking software for abusive ads within here, um, other types of software within here to make sure that antivirus won't detect malware and things like that. So that's what these checkers are within here. So there's basically these underground cybercrime forums that I, I liken to like cybercrime bazaars where there's a whole bunch of different people selling different support services within here. And then there's people buying and selling. And this is a lot of times how that loosely federated cybercrime ecosystem kind of connects and transacts through these within here. And these forums are, are very common, but there's also now they're making use of messaging platforms like Telegram and Discord and things like that as well, kind of less structured within here. But these forums are oftentimes preferred because they allow vetting and reputation and trust to kind of happen in ways that the messaging apps don't quite provide within there. So this is, these underground forums are kind of essential underpinning of what we're seeing within here. And this all right adds up to this streamlined abuse for fee that we're seeing where there's this commoditization of compromised machinery, sensitive user data, human services, and accounts and engagement 
within here where you know, each set of actors have oftentimes chosen area to specialize in and within their specialization, just like in any business, it, they innovate and they become very efficient within their specialization within here. And so for the same reason that businesses specialize, cyber criminals specialize to make the overall ecosystem more efficient. So it's kind of a vicious cycle that happens within here where the attack get cheaper and then they launch more attacks within here if the attacks are effective and profitable then they can reinvest money into this and you get this vicious cycle within here so that's a lot of times what we see when you get overwhelmed by you know those fake antivirus or tech support scammers is this vicious cycle where it's just so lucrative that they have all this money to sink into finding new victims within here and so this, this makes it difficult to attack within here. And just kind of as a price point within here, there's right there's compromised machines, like say my computer gets compromised. Um, how much do you think that someone would pay for my compromised machine within here? How much value does it have on the underground within there? When, when we did this analysis uh, probably about 10 years ago, my machine would probably sell for about 15 to 20 cents on the underground market. So it was normally about 150 to 200 dollars for a thousand compromised machines in the US. Within there. So at this price point, that, that's all that's worth to the attackers. When there, they'll pay 15 to 20 cents for my machine. But think about this from a defender standpoint. If you're actually paying for antivirus you're paying right orders of magnitude more than that to try and defend this resource within your. So these are the kind of asymmetries that I'm talking about within your, where the defenders are paying orders of magnitude more than the attacker's value for the compromised resource. So this is this is what we're up against within your. And I'll I'll go through a specific example of one of these streamlined abuse services. I'll look at the the captcha service. I'm sure that probably most people have encountered the CAPTCHA at this point. It, you know, it started, right, as the distorted text. These days, it's like the images and, you know, finding the traffic stoplights and the images or things like that within your, basically some obfuscated test to try and detect if you're human or not within your. And so um, cyber criminals, right, naturally want to break these because they're they're valuable to register accounts and do other forms of abuse within here. So there was this particular service called GYC Automare. So it was this automated piece of software that was sold on the underground within here, and it would help you register Gmail accounts within here. So the software would identify the CAPTCHA, it would you know, take it into the CAPTCHA, and then the, the customer that bought GYC Automator would then pay for what's called a CAPTCHA solving service within your One of the big ones at the time of our study was called DCAPTCHA. In fact, they made an API that other <laughs> CAPTCHA solving farms cloned so they could integrate with this type of software <laughs> within there. So they made an API that would basically became the de facto standard for CAPTCHA solving services. Within here, so the operators of GYC would pay DCAPTCHA, which was the front end, customer facing front end for people that wanted to solve the captures. And we did some sleuthing and we found that DCAPTCHA also had a back end on these underground forums that they were advertising on labor sites in the normally in the um, South kind of Asia within there. And they had a brand name called Pitch Profit for the back end. And so this was a back end for CAPTCHA solving workers within here. And then they would offer, you know, a fraction of what they were paid to solve the CAPTCHAs to the CAPTCHA solving workers within here. The CAPTCHA solving workers normally made, so retail, you'd pay about a dollar to two dollars to solve a thousand CAPTCHAs. Within here, the workers were paid the equivalent of sweatshop labor. Uh, is it true that there was a uh, a captcha solving service that utilized porn sites and put the uh, the captchas to be solved up on the porn sites 
so that the users of the porn sites would solve those captures in order to proceed to see the uh, photos that they were seeking to see. Was that this, this did happen? Um, and the scale of it was probably a lot lower than these capture solving farms within here, but that that was a strategy that they used to try and recruit workers for them. Um, but my my understanding is, yeah, that that was kind of niche. And so it wasn't involved in this kind of large scale industrial capture solving farms that exist. So it is a strategy. It's probably not as effective as paying sweatshop labor for your capture solvers within there. And also these were highly skilled trained capture solvers. <laughs> within here. And so this is just an example of this. And we, we actually found an operator of one of these capture solving farms. And so we interviewed them and we asked them about machine learning and you know optical character recognition and other things. And had they tried this and why were they using the sweatshop labor instead of uh, you know AI and machine learning to solve the captures? within there and at the time the operator said yes he you know he has experimented with machine learning optical character recognition solve the captures he's like you know i'll buy the software from someone for you know a few thousand dollars it'll work for a while and then it'll break <laughs> within there so it was it was expensive and unreliable was kind of what he found within there so opportunistically when he found some good you know someone selling some good uh, ocr that could solve you know some major captcha he would opportunistically plug it into his site and you know use it until it broke within there but for reliability he preferred the humans within there because you know they were adoptable it was you know it, it was a way to operate a reliable business instead of you know, relying on expensive, unreliable the optical character recognition, machine learning type algorithms within there. So that was at least one data point from the attackers of their thoughts of machine learning. Again, put in the context, you know, this was Citro like 10 years ago. So perhaps the machine learning has become more accessible and more cheaper and more um, resilient than it was 10 years ago within there and perhaps now you know, capture solving services can effectively operate on machine learning within there. But these are, this is at least the thinking that goes into a cyber criminal and their usage of machine learning is, they're not technologists, right? They're business people within there. So if the machine learning makes business sense for them to use, they'll use it. If, you know, the, it, if it's not reliable, if it's too expensive, they're not gonna use it because they have to operate a business within there. So at least from the attacker's perspective, that's normally their thinking in terms of machine learning. So again, presumably as the machine learning becomes more reliable and cheaper, more accessible, they're going to utilize the machine learning more and more, and it will drive down the cost of their attacks within there. And you know, you'll see an arms race within there because clearly the defenders are using a lot of machine learning within their infrastructure. In fact, right, Google um, probably rarely you see a real CAPTCHA these days within there because most of it's just machine learning fraud detection within there. And if the fraud detection algorithm you know, comes back saying that you're that there's a very low risk that you're fraudulent, they're not even going to show you one of these hard to solve CAPTCHAs within there. So that's another example of machine learning being used by the defenders within there where they found that the machine learning perhaps is more reliable than the you know, obfuscated text at determining human from automation within there. But you're obviously going to get these loops of you know, um, arms races between the AI within there where right once the defenders and the attackers have you know, deployed their AI, then it's going to be this arms race within there. and you know, oftentimes, right, the attackers have the job of obfuscating and the defenders have the job of detecting within there. And at least previously, 
the obfuscating job has been easier and the detection job has been harder within there. So that might give you some idea of you know, how the AI arms race is going to play out within there, but it's unclear within there. So that's just one example within here. There's, you know, there's streamlined sites to buy stolen credit cards within here with fancy logos and shopping carts. And you know, they accept Bitcoin payments within here and they're basically fully automated, just websites where you can buy and sell stolen credit cards. Within here, so right, um, historically, cybersecurity is focused on protecting users and systems within here. But once we understand that, right, that there's all these different support services, this opens up you know, them to potential new innovations, interventions within here, where we can think up new interventions within here. We can perhaps try and you know, exhaust parts of their supply chain. We can prevent payments, perhaps between victims and cyber attackers or between cyber attackers each other to each other within there, it's probably easier to disrupt victim to cyber criminal payments than it is to, you know, disrupt cyber criminal, cyber criminal payments. And we can also look right for key support service actors where there's you no, know, perhaps a high level sophistication and there's a, not a lot of different actors that are providing a service and perhaps target them for law enforcement within there, but we need, right, we need ways of thinking about this within here. So I'm gonna go back to that um, Viagra example within here. So this is one example where our team did a big deep dive looking at the economics of the, uh, you know, the counterfeit pharmaceuticals that were sold online within here. And I'll just quickly go through a, a real world example within here of one of these pharmacy value chains within here. So this was a, this is a real world example. This spam email originated from what was called the Grum bot network within here. For those of you that aren't familiar with the bot network, it's just simply a large collection of compromised machines that are controlled by one entity within here. And so the Grum bot network was sending out counterfeit pharmaceutical spam within your and within the spam right there's you know the hook to get you to look at the low cost counterfeit pharmaceuticals and then there's a, a url right there's to for you to click within here the url has a domain name that domain name needs to be registered this was a dot are you domain name so it was registered by reg.ru in russia within your and reg.ru is you know known as a domain registrar that is permissive of cyber criminal attacks <laughs> within there. So they're a registrar that's friendly to cyber criminals within here. And then right once this domain has been registered, then you need to do the resolution of domain name, the actual IP address and IP addresses are right are how machines are actually contacted on the internet within here. And this resolution is done through what is called a DNS server within here. So this is a server that needs to be set up. And this DNS server was set up in China within here in what's called a bulletproof hosting facility. So bulletproof meaning that if you complain, right, that they're resolving domains for cyber criminals, they're not going to do anything about it. So they're going to protect the cyber criminals within here. And this is another one of those you know, streamlined abuse services specialized that have cropped up when there. So then once the domain has been resolved to an IP address, then the user's computer can actually contact that website and get a copy of the page when there. So the website was located in Brazil and it was just a really lightweight web proxy server within here. It was a virtual server hosted in Brazil within your pretty much ephemeral disposable infrastructure. So this was meant to be cheap to replace within here. So these, these web proxies normally get taken down by the tens to hundreds daily within here and the cyber criminals will simply replace them for a low cost within here. So now, right, the user has a copy of this and they can look at it 
with an ear. And by the way, right, this, this web server doesn't actually have a copy of the website, doesn't actually have the database of the e-commerce website. So that's actually located on another server that's hidden by the web proxy that's located in Russia with an ear. And that web server is operated um, by a class of business that in Russian, I'm probably butchering this, is called Parknera and roughly translates to affiliate program in English within there. And this particular one went by the name of Pharmacy Express. They've since rebranded to Malian within your, and this is kind of a central business operation of the pharmaceutical spam value chain within your. So this Russian affiliate program is kind of the main director of the business operation of spam within your. And it turns out that this affiliate program recruits these botnet masters, people that operate these major botnets, and they offer them commissions. So these botnet masters are actually affiliate marketers working on commission for these affiliate programs within there. So the affiliate programs, depending on how good the, the botnet master is generating sales, they will get between, say, roughly about 30 to sometimes upwards of half of the revenue from each sale that that botnet generates within here. So this, this affiliate program is kind of the linchpin driving this whole operation. And then say the user, you know, they browses, they see some pharmaceuticals that they actually want to purchase. Purchasing, you know, in the Western hemisphere online normally means through a credit card payment within your, so let's suppose that's Visa that they want to pay with, within your, which has, right, the biggest market penetration in the US. So uh, Visa actually doesn't directly settle any payments. They, they act as a network to facil facilitate payment settlements between different banks. And so it'll be the, right, the user's bank that issued the user's credit card. Notice, right, when you get a Visa credit card, it's issued by like Chase, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, something like that within your, and then the second bank will be what's called the acquiring bank or the merchant bank. And so in the case of this, when we did test purchase, that bank was the Azure Zuri Bank in Azerbaijan. So it was a bank mostly set up to do oil settlement payments, but it also had the ability to accept payments through Visa's network within your, and so this merchant bank was, account was set up by the affiliate program in Russia, uh, Pharmacy Express within your, to accept payments for the, counterfeit online pharmaceutical sales. And then the final part is the actual manufacturing and fulfillment within your, and for this, they used an Indian generic pharmaceutical manufacturer that again, the Russian affiliate program contracted with to manufacture and then drop ship into the US, the counterfeit pharmaceuticals within your. And so this is the full value chain within your. And then, right, the big question is, if we were to snip this link in any one place, could we disrupt it? And which would be the most um, tractable for us to actually disrupt while being the most difficult and expensive for them to replace? So this was the focus of our research, was looking at where in this value chain could we actually disrupt it that would actually impact their operations within here. And so this is where we start collecting some data. Um, some of the data we fortuitously got through basically a turf war between two of these Russian operators within the air. So there were these two operators, um, Pavel Vuvyovsky and Igor Gusev. They co-founded one of the major online payment programs in Russia called Chronopay. They had a falling out, Igor Gusev left and he started an operation called GlavMed that came under pressure. And so they rebranded as Spamit that was one of the major online pharmaceuticals. He was making a lot of money. His business partner, Pavel, got jealous and Pavel started up Rx Promotions. Rx Promotions claim to fame is that they sold opioids um, like Vicodin and Oxycontin on their online pharmacies, which was considered too risky for most of the other ones to actually sell. Um, a good journalist who's also a friend and a collaborator, Brian Krebs, wrote a great book about this turf war and the data that resulted from it. So basically these two operators were um, hacking each other's infrastructure and they leaked the data, the backend data to Brian Krebs. 
Brian Krebs then gave the data to us to analyze. Within your, so this was backend databases, customer records, um, payments to vendors and affiliates and things like that, that we got within your. So we could see, you know, gross revenue, uh, close to $200 million, over a million customers, 1.5 million purchases, more purchases than customers. So customers were reordering from these pharmaceutical programs. That gives you an indication of the quality of what they were delivering. And when we um, found some techniques to measure the revenue across a larger selection of the affiliate programs, we found about $500 million in revenue that they were making. Again, we had detailed cost records within here so we could see all the costs. You know, the biggest cost was the commissions to the advertisers, the botnet masters and things like that. Within here, the other thing we noticed is that they were paying a lot for their credit card payment processing. So typical credit card payment processing will run you about two to 3%. They're paying in the neighborhood of 10 to 15%, way more than most people do. And the gross margins were pretty boring. This was a business retail margins within your, which means it's vulnerable to economic disruptions within your, right? It, they're only running at about 10 to 20% gross margins. If we can you know, increase costs in different levels, we can make them become unprofitable. Within your quick note about where the payment comes from, virtually all of it came from credit card. They experimented with other methods. All of them failed. They're dependent on credit card payments. Within your, so then um, we tried to get large scale measurements of this ecosystem to measure out more of these value chains within your. And we did this through this data collection pipeline. We started with a major spam feed from a major free email provider mine this for URLs. We built crawling infrastructure for the pages, um, right? There's, you know, hundreds of thousands of these pages. They're very ephemeral within here, but we, we use some machine learning to cluster these down to the actual affiliate programs by looking for similarities in the websites. When there, once we did this, we did some sleuthing on the underground and we did some test purchasing to measure that payment and fulfillment end that you can't get with just technical crawling. So we did some test purchases within here. So this is where I start buying pharmaceuticals and counterfeit goods off of the internet. Within here, thinking that I'm gonna get ripped off, but lo and behold, when we order these you know, items start appearing, blister packed lot numbers, you can trace them back to pharmacies, uh, manufacturers in India. Within here, we're actually getting reasonable quality products out of them and pretty much every purchase results in an attempt to try and deliver what I ordered within here. Sometimes I was lazy, didn't go to the post office, got returned, instantly refunded by these programs. Amazing customer service. <laughs> within here, we got the bizarre ones like that. Um, we crunched the numbers on this and we found a bottleneck in their payment processing within here. So basically three banks accounted for almost all of their payment processing. The AG Bank did most of the pharmaceutical processing. St. Kitts Bank did most of the um, herbal supplement processing. And the DB and Nord Bank did most of the counterfeit software sales. DB and Nord is a little bit um, deceptive. It was actually the Latvian branch of DB and Nord. So DB and Nord had bought a Latvian bank and inherited some cyber criminal accounts within it. And so what we found when we started learning about credit card processing and banks and things like that is that it is high risk to sell you know, counterfeit pharmaceuticals and other counterfeit goods on the internet. If the banks and credit card companies get wise to this, they will fine you and cut your accounts and keep all your money basically within there. So there is, you know, there is a lot of due diligence that's done to give out one of these high risk accounts, a lot of upfront capital, a lot of forfeitures, and so there's a lot of money on the line. The cyber criminals will lose hundreds of thousands of dollars when they lose one of these bank accounts within your. So this is a real pain point for them. And so, right, we have this hypothesis that we can target these merchant accounts, demonetize this ecosystem, and maybe we found an asymmetry where, you know, for a few hundred dollars, we can get one of these accounts shut down and it'll cost them hundreds of thousands of dollars to replace it within there. So a rare asymmetry that favors us. So this is where I ramp up the purchasing of pharmaceuticals to track their bank infrastructure over time with, you know, we had an OCD student that organized all of the purchases within here. 
And bottom line is, yes, this works. So a major pharmaceutical manufacturer that doesn't want to be named and Microsoft replicated our methodology, Microsoft for counterfeit software. Within there, we tracked it over you know, um, a year and some change, 800 purchases. We tracked the impact of it, lots of takedowns. We joined the programs to assess the, the um, penalties within there. The one thing that I must note is when we did our original study um, identifying credit card payments of the bottleneck, the White House stepped in and um, twisted some arms to make the credit card industry increase their due diligence and their fines to try and get rid of the cybercrime within here. So the bank fees were elevated and it became harder to get this kind of merchant accounts within here. So this made it the, the interventions even more effective within here. So these were the original programs that were operating. After the intervention, a lot of them died out. Within here, we joined the underground. We can see that they're not very pleased by what's happening within this intervention. Bottom line is this payment intervention was wildly effective, much more effective than we'd ever seen in you know, filtering or taking down botnets or other types of disruption attempts within here. Demonetizing this ecosystem really had a huge effect within here. The other thing that happened was um, Igor and Pavel were paying off officials to try and get each other arrested. So Igor fled the country to Turkey, Pavel was not so smart. He didn't flee the country and he was actually arrested. Within here, um, he was later though released from jail. So Putin wanted someone to start up a alternate network to Visa and MasterCard because of the you know, concerns about sanctions. So he let Pavel out on the condition that Pavel helped him build a national payment infrastructure within there. So arresting people sometimes can happen, but it's hard and difficult. So in summary, right, these black markets, they you know, allow for innovation and efficiency. They also introduce fragilities into the network within here. The scale renders them vulnerable to infiltration by you know, just semi-skilled people like myself and other researchers. Undermine the business elements can be hugely effective within your end, you know, oftentimes much more effective than technical defenses against these kinds of attacks within there. So this is, this is a fruitful area to push on and look at for research for disrupting cybercrime is kind of tackling the cybercrime head on instead of trying to filter it within there. So for that, I will say thank you. And um, I have not left much time for questions. So I will probably hand it back over, but thank you for the inline questions. Okay, well, thank you so much, Damon, for your presentation. We thank everyone on this call for joining us this afternoon and hope you will join us um, on August 3rd for the next lecture and lecture, uh, which will be hosted by Laura Edelson. And her topic is defending against disinformation. Laura studies online political communication and develops methods to identify inauthentic content and activity. This concludes today's lunch and lecture, and we hope you all have a wonderful day.